Welcome back, Elite Myrmidons, to the first ever deep dive episode for Greek Mythology Retold Podcast. In these episodes, I take you into the meat and bones, the heart and soul of individual essays, articles, and books I've researched on Greek mythology and the Trojan War for my book series, and the Greek Mythology Retold Podcast. If you love Greek myths and the Trojan War, you're in the right place. This is part two of our exploration of Dr. Douay's paper on Achilles and mothering similes in Homeric text. In part one, we discussed the Homeric mother bird and mother grief similes, as well as traditional ancient Greek mother's laments that follow a pattern of grief and sorrow, anger, and then revenge. These literary devices used by Homer through Achilles' character clearly place Achilles in a mothering role regarding his relationship with Patrocles and his men. Also in part one, I posit that by overlooking these references and hyper-focusing on sexuality, we narrow rather than discover more about Achilles. We can't ignore the nine years of fighting he has been through and the toll that took and how that wartime experience must have shaped him in the relationships that he had with Patrocles and the Myrmidons. In fact, I go so far as to say the similes are not sexual in nature, and that in the context of what we know as soldiers' grief, both ancient and modern, we come to a deeper understanding and appreciation of warriors from the past and present, thereby sharpening the facets of the greatest of the Greeks, Achilles. Part two of Douay's paper focuses on another set of mothering similes, this time from a paper by Dr. Ebert, the co-author. The focus in this section is on Homer's description of Teucer and Ajax in battle. The passage is from Book 8 of the Iliad, lines 266 through 272, roughly. Teucer came ninth, bending back his curving bow, and he stood under the shield of Ajax, son of Telamon. When Ajax was lifting his shield up and out, and then the hero, once he looked around, would shoot someone in the crowd and hit him, that man falling down on the spot lost his life, and then Teucer would go back, like a child runs behind his mother, to Ajax, and Ajax would hide him with his shining shield. Ajax is keeping Teucer safe beneath his shield, the way a mother keeps her child safe by putting the child behind her, literally using her body as a shield. To get to my child, you have to get through me first. This is a powerful use of the protective mothering image, one I'm sure wasn't lost on an ancient audience, as it is not lost on us. The image of a mother standing strong with a young child clinging to her clothes, peering from behind her hip, to see the danger she knows her mother protects her from. It isn't an accident that Homer uses the image of a protective mother to parallel with warriors. Ajax and Teucer are half-brothers, and Ajax is clearly given the protector's role. Ajax is the son of Telamon and his legitimate wife. Teucer is Telamon's son by his captive wife, Hesione, who was... King Priam's sister, and this is the King Priam of Troy. Hesione was taken prisoner by Heracles and given to Telamon during the first Trojan War, which I do reference in uh, the first three episodes of Greek Mythology Retold. Teucer is the illegitimate younger brother of Ajax, so we have two blood brothers and still the mothering simile is used. It evokes an image of Ajax standing tall because he was one of the biggest men next to Achilles, with Teucer needing his brother's protection so he could shoot his arrows. Later in the story, Ajax is tricked by Athena over a fight he had with Odysseus about who got Achilles' armor. Ajax goes crazy, and when he realizes what he's done, he kills himself. It's now Teucer's turn to stand guard over his brother's body. 
Another mothering image is used when Patrocles is killed by Hector and the Trojans try to take Patrocles' body and strip it of Achilles' armor. The Greeks know that if they allow the Trojans to take Patrocles' body, Achilles' anger would likely be turned toward them as well as the Trojans. Menelaus stands guard over the body and is compared to a cow protecting her firstborn. The mothering imagery is used time and again to explain the relationship between men of war with each other. Athena is also cast in the protecting mother role. She protects Menelaus on the field in Book 4, lines 127 through 133, by deflecting an arrow coming straight at Menelaus. She kept it far from your skin, as when a mother keeps a fly from her child when he lies in sweet sleep, and she guided it to where the golden clasp of the belt joined and the two parts of the breastplate met. In this case, Athena deflected what would have been a fatal strike. Menelaus is likened to the sleeping child, vulnerable. Douay and Ebit also mention that Athena is also referred to as a protective mother for Odysseus when she helped him win the sprint. What's significant is Athena is the goddess of warfare, specifically the strategies of war, and is a fellow warrior. The authors make the point that the mothering similes are used to describe the protective relationship between soldiers in wartime. What we can conclude at this point is that warriors in the Iliad used mothering references to express their emotions about one another in combat situations and while at war. And these emotions are similar to the way modern American soldiers feel about their comrades. I think it's safe to say that even though the instruments of war may change, the emotional bonds warriors make and their experiences remain relatively the same. This brings us to the third and final section of the joint paper by Drs. Duet and Ebit. The focus here now turns to the modern soldier. They bring up that by Book 9, Achilles, quote, has only begun to experience the grief of war, end quote. This makes me think also of Dr. Shea's book, Achilles in Vietnam, where he outlines how PTSD affects combat veterans. By the Iliad, the war is in its ninth year and counting down to the bitter end. This is like nine tours of war, only no one has been back home and returned and no one has been furloughed. This is a very long stretch of time to be away from family and one's home cut off from their prior lives, and by the ninth year, home must seem more like a dream with fuzzy edges than what lay before them. By year nine, both Greeks and Trojans have seen enough blood and gore to last a lifetime. Just because they lived thousands of years ago doesn't preclude them from experiencing what we would consider today combat PTSD. The middle of the Iliad is full of gory details, spears running through bladders, cracking bones, teeth flying in the air, jaws smashed, mangled bodies, and blood slit ground. Death has been a constant companion since the beginning of the fighting, and I think we can imagine that the Greeks, including Achilles, have been dealing with emotional and mental traumas for a while. But for Achilles, it takes the unexpected death of Patrocles to tip him over the edge into revenge mode. Patrocles was his special comrade in Dr. Shea's terms and the child in the Homeric similes. So his death is the one thing Achilles can't take, the only thing that will strip whatever is left of Achilles' humanity away and reveal the beast within. Shea has an entire chapter dedicated to this state he labels, quote, berserker. As we've noted, Achilles is prevented from going into combat when he hears the news because, as angry as he is, he's not an idiot and he knows he can't enter battle without armor. He's a big enough guy, he can't just wear anyone's spare or confiscated armor. He is forced to wait for vengeance, but that weight allows his anger to burn from red to white hot. Revenge follows anger, which follows grief. 
This pattern of the grief of war is evident in both the ancient and modern soldiers' experiences. Douay and Ebit now turn to the documentary, Restrepo. And let me say here that I ordered this from Amazon Prime Video and watched it. It is very powerful, edgy, and sad. Maybe beyond sad. I was profoundly sad. Tim Hetherington embedded himself into the unit he was filming, and after a while he says they accepted him. His goal was to show combat in Afghanistan through the soldier's eyes. He describes his experience as entwined with the soldiers after a while. Duet and Ebit liken this permeability to an ancient singer who would have become the characters as they told the story. Hetherington talked about the time when one of the men in the unit was killed by enemy fire and the enemy was trying to get to his body to steal it. Homer describes Menelaus and Ajax as protective mothers while protecting the bodies of fallen comrades. And Hetherington starts to weep and says that when this happened, they asked him to stop filming. It was the only time he was asked to stop. It was obviously emotionally traumatic, and even when it was over and time passed, it was still raw and capable of evoking great grief. When the documentary picks up, the reaction to the fallen comrade is recorded. One man is held away by another as he weeps, inconsolable, not unlike Antilochus and Achilles. Their desire for revenge followed. When it was safe, their captain ordered that he wanted the entire enemy compound destroyed. He also ordered another to shoot the enemy's head off if he saw the guy who'd killed their comrade. No one hesitated or flinched at the order, and this follows the pattern we see in the Iliad. Sorrow, grief, anger, and revenge. Ebit also discusses how she viewed Homeric soldiers' expressions of grief, namely the weeping. Before watching Restrepo, she chalked the weeping up to a cultural difference, but after she saw it completely different. She saw modern combat soldiers cry like she'd read in the Iliad, and realized that maybe it's more about the nature of warfare and combat trauma than culture. I've seen many discussions or comments that the weeping and sobbing in the Iliad by men is perceived as whiny or crybabyish or over-the-top which totally negates the fact that men, even warriors, are capable of passionate response and expressions of grief through weeping, regardless of the time period. It makes me think of stories where returning combat veterans struggle to reintegrate into civilian life, that even though they love their families and maybe all they dreamed about was being able to come home, that once they were home, home was no longer a place that they fit into. Home was the same, but they had changed. Between themselves, combat veterans seem more at ease expressing such deeply held pain. Maybe we should take that cue and see the Homeric grief cycle among the warriors as more a normal reaction to the toll of death and loss. The essay concludes by reiterating that Sergeant Petri and Achilles refer to feeling like mother birds. They are universals in war, transcending time, and that the mothering similes express a, quote, profound truth about the relationship between warriors in combat. Well, that's it for now. This deep dive is over. Hope you've enjoyed it, and I'll talk with you next time on the Greek Mythology Retold podcast. And be sure to follow me on my socials, Twitter at G Retold, that's short for Greek Mythology Retold, and Facebook at Greek Mythology Retold. And if you like, you can also follow me on my author socials, Twitter at Raven Angel, Facebook at Janelle Rhiannon, YouTube at Janelle Rhiannon, and my Insta is Janelle Rhiannon Author. Thank you for joining me, and I hope you have a most wonderful day, and I'll see you next time.